Good afternoon. My name is Ron Parks, and I'd like to welcome you to the IFA uh, webinar uh, conference for IFA Korea. Today, our opening remarks were supposed to be given by President of IFA Korea, Mr. Kyungbong An. Unfortunately, he cannot join us. Uh, on his behalf, Mr. Yoon Oh, Vice President of IFA Korea, is here to give the opening remarks. Mr. Yoon Oh. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yuno. I am working for Hanyang University as a uh, law professor of tax law. And uh, as already, Bob already said, uh, unfortunately, uh, Professor Kyung Bong An, the president of IFA Korea, is out of town today for business reason. And uh, he asked me to deliver his message on his behalf. Uh, so, uh, and asked me uh, to uh, uh, read uh, his uh, message he has already prepared. So uh, let me uh, read his writing. Mm. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I am Kyung Bong An, president of IFA Korea. Today marks uh, 2021 uh, 20, uh, IFA Korea, Korea Tax Conference webinar. We thank each and every one of you for being here with us today. Pleasure is all ours to welcome those of you that have been with us for a long time, as well as uh, those who are new to the IFA Korea. Before we start, on behalf of the IFA Korea, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all of them who generously helped making this conference a success. We are truly grateful to uh, Lee and Go LLC and Yulchon LLC for providing us with the venue for filming this webinar. Special thanks goes to go to uh, Kyung Lee, Vice Chairman of the International Affairs Standing Committee of IFA Korea, uh, Ted Taegyung Kim, Secretary General of International Affairs Standing Committee of IFA Korea, and in particular, international tax experts from several law firms and accounting firms who are willingly taking the time to participate in each session as moderators, speakers, and panelists. We could not have made it without them. Uh, 2021 IFA Korea, Korea Tax Conference webinar will take place today and tomorrow. Today, we have four sessions coming up for foreign companies operating in Korea, which are respectively about recent tax appeal and court decisions related to international tax in Korea, uh, recent trends in tax and customs audits and tax rulings in Korea, update on risk transfer pricing rules and transfer pricing implications of COVID-19 on MNEs, and Korea's proposed tax law amendments for 2021 impacting global companies doing business in Korea. Tomorrow, we will have another four sessions for Korean companies entering overseas, whose topics are composed of OECD, IF, final agreement on digital tax, Korea's proposed tax law amendment for 2021, then may impact Korean multinationals, the impact of the proposed U.S. tax reform bill, and updates on Vietnamese tax law and administration. Now, looking at Korea's proposed tax law amendment for 2021, the criteria for judging the tax burden rate of a specific foreign corporations for the application of the CFC rules will be changed from 15% or less of the income actually earned by the corporation to not more than 70% of the highest corporate tax rate. And if Korean nationals directly or indirectly hold the beneficial right of a foreign trust, which can be treated as a separate tax taxation unit, the trust property will be regarded as a foreign corporation and the CFC rules will be applied to the trust. As a target of application of the CFC rules 
is expanded, it is estimated that the tax revenue will increase by 90 billion won over the next five years. Accordingly, the compliance cost of a taxpayer is expected to increase significantly. This is just one of many topics we will cover in two days. I hope the conference to be a useful forum to introduce developments in the field of international taxation over the last year in Korea for foreign companies operating in Korea and to inform Korean companies uh, entering foreign countries about the potential issues they may face in these foreign tax regimes. Two participants, many thanks to your passion for international taxation. Your patience help us all unite. During the next two days, we will be learning about the various themes through our planned sessions with your active participations. Should you have any questions or comments, please send them via WebEx or YouTube chat to the moderator of each session so they could get to the panel. Although this webinar goes on a limited time frame, I hope you find this webinar productive, full of opportunities for learning, an exchange of fields and networking. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you especially to Doug Lukat, the chairperson of the ECCK, and Jajin Kim, president of KIPF, for making the congratulatory remarks. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Yuno. Uh, next, we will have congratulatory remarks. Uh, they will be given by Mr. Dirk Lukat, who is chairperson of ECCK. Uh, Dirk will be joining us online. Um, are you there, Dirk? My name is Christoph Haider, President of the European Chamber of Commerce in Korea. I'm very pleased to deliver the congratulatory message for this year's Korea Tax Conference virtually. Attended by tax authorities, professionals, and academics, I'm sure this conference will benefit all participating parties. And now let's go to taxation. This year, we have seen big headlines on a reform of international taxation rules, ensuring that multinational companies pay a fair share of tax wherever they operate. As you all know, this reform consists of two main pillars. Pillar one is intended to ensure fair distribution of taxes by handing over taxing rights to, multinational, to countries multinational companies are operating in and even if companies do not have a legal entity in this market. And pillar two foresees a global minimum corporate tax rate. Ladies and gentlemen, even if you like it or not, this new taxation scheme, in fact, is one of the most impressive international commitments what I have seen in the recent past. I always try to be a good citizen and our chamber also tries to be a good corporate citizen. We really live what is understood under corporate social responsibility. And paying our fair share of corporate income tax is for us a moral task. Something maybe we don't do with pleasure, but definitely without stomach remorse. And paying taxes is not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. We as business organizations, benefit from an excellent public infrastructure, an outstanding healthcare system, and last but not least, a top educational system from which we receive talented and skillful employees. So overall, I'm grateful, but also a bit proud what all is financed with our taxpayers' money. In this respect, I believe that those taxes we pay as business organizations create for us, for, our, for business, a positive return on investment. I said that we are a good corporate citizen. Nevertheless, I would like to encourage the audience here to ensure 
that taxes are not further rising, here I count on you. So I hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk. We have a final uh, congratulatory remark, and that will be given by Mr. Jajin Kim. Uh, Mr. Kim is the head of the Cree Institute for Public Finance. Mr. Kim. Good afternoon. I am Jajin Kim, the president of KIPF, Korea Institute of Public Finance. It is my great honor to give these congratulatory remarks for 2021 Korea Tax Conference hosted by the International Fiscal Association in Korea. Thank you for inviting me to this meaningful event. As the president of Korea's the only national research institute for tax and public finance, and on behalf of my fellow researchers striving for the betterment of the field, I am sending my sincere gratitude and a warm welcome to all of you virtually gathered together. I believe the one common purpose brought us to be here, which is to share the insight from the fast changing global tax environment and seek for the right direction of its development. Oliver Walden Holmes, who is a jurist and a legal practitioner said, Taxes are what we pay for a civilized society. After COVID-19 pandemic, the global value chain is rapidly reconfiguring. And to cope with the disaster, governments and multinational enterprises around the world are busy responding. Considering the current trend, international tax is the most important variable and a key for the next generation who will live in a totally different world where everything will be connected. Pandemic requires the increase in tax revenue and it fastened the adoption of international tax system targeting multinational enterprises such as a digital service taxes and the carbon border tax. These days, countries are continuously exert that effort to undertake tax change to attract FDI and bring domestic companies operate in foreign country back. On the other hand, enterprises are responding with more exquisite income measurement and aggressive tax evasion. Responding to these changes, global tax system should ensure the tax revenue generated from international trade will be, will be fairly allocated. Thus, it should aim for the direction that attracts consistent investment of enterprises by creating stabilized environment for global economy. Recently, at OECD and G20 meeting, the implementation plan for the two-pillar solution and its final decision on the digital services has been discussed in the inclusive framework. With the consent of 136 IF members out of 140, the discussion has been open to the public. This marks the historical formation of the global tax reform framework that has been achieved through the four years of intensive multinational negotiations. Notably, the agreement between the reallocating party and receiving party of the taxing rights reached on the allocation rate of 25% for the exceeding profit. Moreover, it is a remarkable achievement and a victory of the nation-centric egoism that a unilateral measure used to invoke commercial disputes and increase risks for the businesses has been abolished. When the agreement gets the ratification at the G20 summit in Rome, which happens in two days, each nation country will undertake the negotiations on the technical details 
before the amendment in domestic legislation. Indeed, he has, it has untied the Gordian knot in the statement of a clash among national interests and allowed a great shift for the international tax system after 100 years of establishment. Dear participants and audience, despite the recent great achievement, we should not sit back and lose the attention. Even at this early stage, the delay in implementation of digital service taxes has been forecasted due to the possible political dispute during the legislation and its institutionalization. Considering the negotiations of the carbon border tax in its entering stage, greater difficulty for the international tax system reform seems predictable. However, the lessons of pandemic have taught us that the individuals and even the countries cannot stand alone. We now know that we are wiser than much stronger than I. If this opportunity for understanding, cooperation and sharing can be continued, it is guaranteed that what has been regarded as an ideal the fair and sustainable international tax system will soon become our reality. Once again, I extend my sincere gratitude for this wonderful opportunity and send my genuine wish for IFA Korea to stand stronger in the field of international tax. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, Mr. Kim. Um, we will now start the sessions, uh, which will run until 6 p.m. this evening. Uh, the first session will be recent tax appeal and court decisions related to international tax in Korea. Uh, this session will be moderated uh, by Mr. Jung Hong Kim, who is the former head of the OECD Tax Center in Korea. With that, I hand it over to the moderator, Mr. Kim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pax. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jung Hong Kim. Uh, I'm truly honored to host this session, one discussion with three distinguished panelists who will introduce and share their views on some recent international tax cases in the Korean court. First, I would like to introduce the panelists and give you some description of their presentations. Uh, seated to my left is Mr. Min Young Sung. Min Young is a partner at Yulchon LLC. He practices primarily in the area of tax litigation and tax advice, focused on international taxation, representing multinational companies, private equity funds, and high net worth individuals. Min Young today will kick off the session with a Supreme Court case on application of tax treaty rates on, on dividends under Korea-Japan Treaty, which is a frequent topic when it comes to treaty entitlements of foreign investors. Seated to his left is Mr. Tom Kwan. Uh, as foreign attorney at Lee & Co., Tom has over 18 years of international tax practice experiences in Korea and in the U.S., including inbound and outbound acquisition structuring, financing, and reorganization. Tom today will present a recent Seoul Administrative Court decision on the income characterization of software payments, which has become more controversial recently with the software transactions evolving ever more complicated and diverse. Then we have Young Hoon Kim to Tom's left. Uh, he is a certified public accountant and a member of the tax team at PKL. He has over 10 years of experience in providing various advice on tax matters related to international tax, including alternative fund investments, cross-border transactions, and foreign investment. Today, Yohun will walk us through a recent Supreme Court case, which settles a long-time controversy on, tech, on treaty on entitlement of company-type CIVs investing in Korea. I think we are about 
five minutes behind schedule. So due to time constraints in this session, after each panel presents, I will ask the panel a question uh, to which the panel will uh, give us a brief answer. With that, uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. Min Young, uh, now you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Kim, for your kind introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Min Young Song, and I'm a partner at Yulchon LLC. Before I jump into my topic, I'd like to thank you for making time to join this event for your business schedule and hope you may find it useful and informative. Today, I'm going to share a recent court decision regarding application of reduced tax rate under the Korea-Japan tax treaty, especially focused on dividend income. As we already know, Korea has concluded tax treaties with many countries based on OECD model tax convention. In case of dividend, Article 10 of OECD model tax convention provides two types of reduced tax treaty rates, 5% and 15%. As you can see in this slide, Article 10 of the Korean-Japan tax treaty provides similar reduced tax rate for dividend. In terms of 5% low rate, this treaty prescribes several requirements. The main criteria are beneficial owner, owns at least 25% of voting shares, and during certain period. Among these requirements, I think beneficial owner is the most important, and there is a lot to discuss. But Mr. Young Hoon Kim will explain this issue following my presentation, so I will omit beneficial owner issue in this time. Okay, let me introduce first case. The reference number for this case is Supreme Court decision 2018 to 54408, rendered in July 2021. This recent case deals with interpretation of the accounting period for which the distribution of profits takes place. I would call this phrase the language at issue. Here are underlying facts. A Japanese corporation M acquired 30% of shares in the plaintiff, a Korean corporation, and the plaintiff paid out dividends for fiscal year 2013 in March 2014. At that time, the plaintiff withheld corporate income taxes at the rate of 5%. In 2016, NTS argued that the language at issue must be interpreted to mean the accounting period force in which the resolution to distribute dividends was passed. This argument was supported by Murphy Luling, uh, Ministry of Economy and Finance. Based on this argument, NTS concluded that M is required to have owned the plaintiff shares for six months prior to the end of fiscal year 2014, which means from July 1st to December 31st, 2014. Unfortunately, M sold the entire shares on December 22nd, 2014. As a result, NTS issued a tax assessment applying 50% on the basis that M does not satisfy the requirement of the 5% of treaty rate. However, Supreme Court decided that in taxpayers' favor, which means that the language at issue refers to the accounting period, which is the object of the dividend distribution. That is fiscal year 2013 in this case. First of all, Supreme Court clarified that distribution of profits related to the financial situation in the previous period in which the resolution to distribute falls. In addition, Supreme Court held that the purpose of this requirement is to prevent abusive activities where the ownership ratio is temporarily increased prior to the distribution. The finally, Supreme Court pointed out that NTS's argument results in the unreasonable outcome withholding tax rate cannot be specified at the time that the withholding obligation arises and the withholding tax rate would fluctuate 
exposed factor due to circumstances arising after distribution of the dividends. This decision resolved issues as to the interpretation of the timing at which the ownership requirement in the treaty and thereby uh, ensuring taxpayer foreseeability. Now we will move on to reviewing second case. The reference number for this case is Supreme Court decision 2017-5403 rendered in October 2017. Although this case was finalized four years ago, uh, I would like to introduce this case because this is not well known yet. The issue is whether treasury stock is to be included when determining the threshold of 25% of the voting shares. In this case, a Japanese corporation X owned 24.6% of the total issued shares of Y, a Korean corporation. However, X's ownership ratio was 27% of voting shares, which excluded the treasury stock owned by Y. When paying the dividends to X, Y had applied the 5% tax rate from 2006 to 2010. In November 2010, the NTS expressed its position that this dividend should be subject to tax at a rate of 15%. According to taxpayers' application, the competent authorities of Korea and Japan engaged in a mutual agreement procedure for four years but failed to reach an agreement. After that, NTS issued a tax assessment applying 15% tax rate. Before we look at the content of the decision, let's have a quick view to compare language in the OECD Model Tax Convention and other tax treaties. Like the OECD Model Tax Convention, most of, most of the tax, tax treaties signed by Korea provided that 25% of the capital or 25% of voting powers. By the way, Korea-Japan tax treaty provided it a little differently, 25% of the voting shares issued by the company. Meanwhile, Korea-US tax treaty stipulates 10% of the outstanding shares of the voting stock, so it is quite clear Treasury stock is excluded under Korea US tax treaty. Uh, Supreme Court decided in taxpayers' favor, which means that Treasury stock shall be excluded when calculating 25% ownership ratio of voting shares. In this case, Supreme Court rejected the NTS's appeal by discontinuance of trial. In Korean. Thus, the holding is excerpted from the decision of the High Court. The Korea-Japan tax treaty does not contain any definition of voting shares. Accordingly, the court held that this term is to be interpreted according to the definition it has under the domestic law of the parties of the treaty. In this regard, Korean Commercial Code clearly prescribes that a company's share that are owned by itself, which means treasury stock, do not have any voting rights. Also, the commercial code excludes treasury stock when calculating whether the quorum for a shareholder's resolution has been met because treasury stock has no voting rights. The court held that it is reasonable that the same should apply when interpreting the voting shares within the meaning of Korea-Japan tax treaty. In addition, the court considered the Japanese tax of voting shares and interpretation of the Japanese tax authorities, including US-Japan tax treaty. In conclusion, when treasury stock is excluded, the ratio of voting shares owned by Japanese company X exceeds 25% and the dividends are eligible for the reduced tax treaty rate of 5%. Despite the firm position of Korean tax authorities as witnessed in the falling through of the map, as well as the NTS ruling, the court rendered its decision in accordance with the principles for interpreting tax treaties and comprehensively 
considered uh, various factors. In this respect, I think this case is meaningful to interpret terms not defined in the text treaty. Uh, this wraps up my presentation, and thank you for your attendance again. Oh, thank you, Minyoung, for the excellent presentation. Uh, having been personally involved in the Korea-Japan Treaty nego renegotiation in 1998, I would like to bring your attention to Japan Treaty language provision, which was done in only English as authentic. And the Korean and Japanese versions are translations, which means uh, they are not official. In other words, uh, Korean and Japanese versions can only be supplementary, not prevailing. To my understanding, the English version, quote, accounting period for which the distribution of profits takes place, quote, makes it relatively clear that the relevant fiscal year is the object of the resolution on dividends. In this regard, uh, my question to you is, how much weight should the court give to the translated version of the treaty when English is the only authentic version? That's a very good point. And in case of Korea-Japan tax treaty, which was done in only English as authentic, I think it is reasonable to interpret the treaty based on English version. In my perspective, one of the reasons why this issue occurred is the NTS approached the case based on Korean translation version. In that sense, the conclusion of Korean Supreme Court decision is valid, but there is a regret that the holding is described as, as if they were interpreted focusing on Korean version rather than English version. Meanwhile, Case 1's high court decision devotes a considerable amount to the interpretation of the English text, and I think this approach was appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Minyo. Uh, then, may I invite uh, Tang Kwon, Mr. Tang Kwon, to present on Intergraph case. Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it is also an honor and a pleasure for me to be here uh, to participate in this seminar. Um, today, uh, I would like to discuss a, re a recent court case that may be of relevance and interest to foreign companies doing business in Korea. Um, I cannot disclose the full uh, the name or the full details of this case as this, this, this decision is being uh, currently appealed by the NTS, the Korean Tax Authority. And uh, also, we happen to represent the taxpayer. But I can discuss the general issues uh, raised by the parties and as well as the decision of the court. Um, the relevant facts of this case are as follows. A, a Korean subsidiary, uh, the taxpayer, uh, imported software um, such as engineering and design software used in construction and shipbuilding uh, from its US parent company and then on-sold it, on-sold these uh, software products to Korean customers, um, primarily in, uh, again, construction or, and shipbuilding, um, bundled with uh, technical, uh, various technical services. Uh, the taxpayer um, treated the consideration paid uh, to the U.S. parent company as uh, uh, consideration for the purchase of goods, uh, which, as you may know, is uh, exempt under the Korea-U.S. tax treaty. The, uh, as business profits, so long as the seller does not have a PE in Korea. However, during the tax audit, um, the NTS argued that such payments were actually consideration for the transfer of know-how and therefore um, assessed tax uh, as characterizing the income payment as uh, royalties and assessed uh, withholding tax under Article 14 of the U.S. Korea Tax Treaty. Uh, the tax assessment amount was uh, very significant. Um, the Seoul Administrative Court, which is the trial court that, ha that heard this case, uh, ruled uh, for the taxpayer, uh, and it held that payments at issue uh, were consideration for the purchase of software products and therefore should be treated as business profits rather than royalties under the U.S.-Korea tax treaty. Uh, in arriving at this decision, uh, the court found uh, the following. 
First, the software at issue uh, was a final product, and no right to copy the software was granted to the, by the foreign company to the Korean uh, ta the taxpayer in Korea or to the ultimate customers. Uh, during trial, the NTS had argued that the taxpayer had modified the software prior to distributing the software to Korean customers, but the court found that the NTS failed to prove that the taxpayer modified or tinkered with the product for local customers in any significant way. In fact, uh, the taxpayer proved that this software uh, was widely distributed, not just to customers in Korea, but customers outside of Korea without any meaningful modification. Second, the taxpayer was a local distributor of a US parent company. The court agreed that it was not in the business of receiving IP, such as original source code, and did not have authority to modify any of the products that it sold to customers. Third, during the trial, the NTS did submit into evidence the distribution agreement, among other things, uh, and other legal documents, um, which provided, uh, for example, a confidentiality agreement with respect to the IP, uh, gross of provisions for withholding tax, and so forth. However, the court did not find these provisions, which are you know, standard boilerplate clauses, by the way, um, sufficient or convincing evidence that the payments were for uh, IP. Also, the high price of the software uh, was not uh, evidence of uh, transfer of IP either. Finally, uh, the technical services that the taxpayer provided to customers in re relation to the sale of the software products was determined to be ancillary and supplementary to the sale, the actual sale. There was no evidence that meaningful know-how was transferred uh, to customers during the, pr the provision of the services. So uh, our observations and implications, uh, we just summarized uh, briefly here. Um, the, the Korean Supreme Court has in the past uh, issued a, a number of decisions on this issue uh, back in the 1990s, but those decisions were very brief and did not provide very uh, helpful guidance or legal analysis on how to in characterize uh, payment for software. Uh, the NTS has continued to challenge taxpayers on this uh, characterization issue. Uh, and in fact, the NTS has an incentive to challenge as this issue is determined on a facts and circumstances test. And as many of you are aware, the NTS tends to cherry pick the facts and circumstances that support their position. The relevant basic guidelines to the corporate income tax law, uh, and these are regulations that are uh, published, um, uh, the basic guidelines are regulations that are published by the NTS uh, that give uh, in, that interpret how they will uh, interpret, um, excuse me, interp that show how they will interpret a, a specific provision of the, the tax code. Um, among other things, provides a, a list of criteria to be considered when determining whether a payment for software is royalties or its uh, business income. These factors include, uh, and this is not a complete list, uh, one, whether the purchaser receives the right to use, distribute, and revise the software. Two, whether the seller provided the source code along with the software. And three, whether the seller tailored the software individually for each purchaser. In another recent case, um, which we will refer to as the P case, uh, this actually uh, was decided in 2020, uh, 2019, excuse me, and um, it was uh, and appealed and the appellate court uh, it, uh, ruled in 2020. The NTS was able to convince the court that payment for software should be characterized as royalties. Uh, during our trial, uh, the NTS had also argued strongly that this court should also follow the P case and apply the uh, P case decision per se without uh, a deeper d uh, investigation of the facts. However, court, the court refused to do so and found that the facts and circumstances were sufficiently different from the P case to find that the payment was business profit rather than royalties under the U.S. Korea tax treaty. In addition, the court ruled that the NTS and not the taxpayer has the burden of proving that the transfer of IP took place in order to characterize the income as royalties. We think this case shows the importance of clearly and convincingly documenting and proving that the software being sold by the foreign company does not involve any meaningful transfer of IP rights, uh, copyright, patents, know-how, et cetera, to the Korean purchaser. 
In other words, the specific facts of each business arrangement are critical for this uh, determination. In conclusion, given the large amount at stake in this issue, and in light of the earlier P case, we think this decision provides hope for foreign companies that sell software in the Korean market. Uh, fi some, uh, finally, I would also like to point out briefly that um, this case was related to uh, the U.S.-Korea tax treaty. However, the court did not um, refer to the technical explanations in the U.S. Uh, model treaty. Um, also, the OECD, the, the court did not refer at all to the OECD commentary to Article 12, which also discusses uh, the income characterization of software payments at length. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Okay, thank you, Tom, for your wonderful presentation. I have one comment and one question. Uh, the Intergraph case reminds me of the recent inter Indian Supreme Court case on software payments, namely Engineering Analysis Center of Excellence versus CIT, rendered in March 2021, 20, in which the issue was whether the payment is for the transfer of copyright or use of copyright or not. One difference I find in the Intergraph case is that the Korean tax authorities consider the transaction as transfer of know-how. So this is the question part. Uh, as you mentioned, the court does not seem to refer to the OECD model commentary, which allocates a significant amount of paragraphs to tax issues of software transactions. If I may quote one sentence of the commentary, as a general rule, the characterization of payment for software transfer depends on the nature of the right that the transferee acquires for the use and exploitation of the software. So the question is, in this case, if the OECD model convention commentary was taken into account, would the court's decision have been different or not? Thank you, Mr. Kim. Uh, thank you, uh, that's a very good question. Um, as you pointed out, according to the OECD commentary, uh, payments made for the acquisition of partial rights in, a, in, in the copyright uh, without the transfer or fully alienating the copyright would represent a royalty where the consideration is for the granting of rights to use the program in a manner that would, without such license, constitute an infringement of copyright. Example, uh, relevant examples uh, that are in the OECD commentary are uh, for example, the right to reproduce and distribute software incorporating the copyrighted program and the right to modify the program. In contrast, other types of transactions, uh, the right in, in other types of transactions, the rights acquired are limited to those necessary to enable the user to operate the program only. In such case, the OECD commentary recommends that this transaction is more akin to a sale of goods and thus should be dealt with under Article 7, the Business Profits Article. As many people in, this, in the audience may be aware, the Korean regu tax regulations dealing with the income characterization of software we previously discussed is generally in line with the principles outlined in the OECD Model Convention. Therefore, if the court in our case were to follow the OECD commentary, I think it is inevitable that the court would have arrived at the same conclusion, which I believe is also the correct conclusion. Thank you, and that wraps up our, my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Thank you, Tom. Uh, then turning to the last case, we have now Yonghun Kim presenting on Luxembourg's Sikov case. Yonghun, you have the air. Uh, thank you, Zhang Hong. Hello, everyone. My name is Yonghun Kim, and I'm a tax accountant at BKA. It's very honored to be participated in this session. and. Uh, we'll be discuss discussing the Supreme Court case issued last year, and the case is about the tax eligibility of, of, for the company type CIVs, the collective investment vehicles. So let's look at the background. Uh, CCOPs are the company type CIVs set up the Luxembourg law, and CCOPs were making investment into Korea. Uh, banks enlisted as their custodian with held on the dividends and interest payments paid to CCOP 
and banks apply the reduced withholding tax rate under the Korean Lux Tax Treaty. But the NTS viewed that the tax treaty does not apply to the CCAB. So the main issue in this case is, is whether the benefits of tax treaty apply to the CCAB, which is a company type of CIV. And the court looked at the two issues. And one is uh, whether the CCAB is the tax resident of Luxembourg under the tax treaty purpose. And second is whether the CCAB is the beneficial owner to the dividends and interest income paid to CCAB. So first, first, let's look at the tax residence issues. Uh, tax, tax treaty applies to a residence, and residence is defined as a person who is liable to pay tax in that country according to the residence. So most, most tax treaty entered into by Korea defines tax residents in the same way. But the NTS argued that CCAB was not liable to pay tax because CCAB did not actually pay tax in Luxembourg. They also cited the past Supreme Court decision which held the German limited partners company that is fiscally transparent cannot be regarded as a tax resident under the tax treaty. However, the Supreme Court viewed that the CCAB is a corporate income tax payer under the Luxembourg and, and the CCAB's tax exemption is only based on the Luxembourg fund laws. Supreme Court also considered the fact that the Luxembourg tax authorities officially recognize CCAB as a tax resident of Luxembourg. So Supreme Court decided that CCAB is a tax residence that bears the comprehensive tax liability for uh, as a tax tax for tax purpose. Uh, according to the court decisions, a person who is liable to pay tax does not mean that a person actually has to pay tax. So an entity that is eligible for tax exemption under the relevant laws can still be regarded as a tax resident under the tax treaty. The next is the beneficial ownership issues. Uh, to be eligible for the tax treaty, uh, CCAB should be regarded as the BO to the income. Uh, collective investment vehicles are usually challenged on whether the CIVs can be a BO to the investment income. Uh, that is because the CIVs are the investment vehicle and CIVs business purpose is to make investments and to distribute the, all the investment to income to their investor. So the tax authorities usually argue that the tax treaty should be applied to at the level of investor, not the CIVs level. However, the Supreme Court viewed that the CUP is a collective investment vehicle carrying out its own economic activities. And also the Supreme Court decided that the CUP is a beneficial owner because it concludes the investment contract and acquire the investments asset in the name and discretion of the CUP. So there was no instruction from the investor. Also, as opposed to the investors, the CCAB directly exercised the right to claim the payments of dividends. The interesting is that the Supreme Court did not consider or decide about the substantive ownership issue. So I would like to discuss further about the substantive, substantive ownership issue And this, this, is, this is the administrative court case which issued already this year. And this case dealt with the substantive owners issues for CCAB's case. So looking at the background, uh, after the tax authorities imposition of withholding tax on Korean source income paid out to CCAB, banks withheld by applying the statutory corporate income tax rate 
Uh, this is because to avoid the additional tax risk. And after then, bank buy the tax refund by applying the treaty rate. However, the NTS rejected the, this refund request. And um, one of their arguments is that the Korean Supreme Court did not consider or decide on whether the CCAB can be a substantive owner of the income. So, so let, let's look at the, how the Admin's Court decided on this, these issues. First, the beneficial owners refers to a person who has the right to asset and benefits from the income uh, without the rigor or contractual obligation to transfer it back to another person. And even if taxpayer is recognized uh, as a beneficial owner to income under the tax treaty, uh, taxpayer cannot be regarded as the substantive owner if, if there is a difference between the, the substance and the, the substance and, and the form due to the tax avoidance purpose. So summarizing this, although not all the beneficiaries are substantive, substantive owner, substantive owners are all beneficial owner. Therefore, the beneficial owners of income can be still denied the treaty benefits if they are not the substantive owner to income. Uh, the administrative court decided that CCOB is also substantive owner to the Korean source of income because the, as the Supreme Court decided that the CCOB is eligible to tax treaty that so the Supreme Court's decision implies that the CCOB is also the substantive owner to income. So here are I prepared for the sessions and uh, there was a tax revision. So the issue of tax treaty applications for overseas investment vehicle has been settled effective from January 2020. But still, I think the, those two cases we have looked at are meaningful for taxpayer because there were clear distinction between the substantive ownership and the BO. So I, I, I hope that this, this, this discussion would, would be helpful for you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Yong Hun, for your great presentation. Um, in Korean international tax practice, the BO and substantive owner tests have been one of the most frequent issues of controversy between the taxpayer and the National Tax Service. Given the 2018 CJ ENM case decision of the Supreme Court, in which the BO and substantive ownership tests are separately addressed, I'm wondering why the Supreme Court in this CCAP case was silent in examining the substantive ownership test. Personally, I'm of the view that the BO issue need not be given much weight so long as the substantive ownership concept subsumes the BO concept because the key conceptual components of substantive owner includes control, management, and disposal of the income, which necessarily implies the use and enjoyment concept in BO. In this regard, what's your take on the need to examine both the BO and substantive ownership tests in this case. Uh, uh, I, I agree with you, and conceptually, the BO is a broader one than substantive ownership, and uh, substantive ownership includes a BO concept. So for, for the taxpayer, it is more important to consider the substantive ownership test to, to be eligible for tax treaty. So I think it would have been more helpful for Korean Supreme Court to have decided on the substantive ownership issue for Sikov's case. But, uh, how, but if we look at the Korean Supreme Court's one key reasoning for finding Sikov is the BO, uh, it is that Sikov is able to enter, to enter into the investment contract and Sikov have the a direct authority to, to claim the payments of dividend. So I think this 
these facts are also connected to the substantive ownership concept. So, so based on the fact, the CCAP has the right over the control and, and management and disposal of income, which is key factor for substantive ownership. So, so if uh, the Supreme Court was silent on the substantive ownership issue on, for CCAP's case, but it seems that the Supreme Court also considered the key fact for, for substantive ownership when they made a decision. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We have uh, about five more minutes. So uh, before we go, can I uh, pick up uh, the last point in Young Hoon's presentation? He, he mentioned. Uh, the recent corporate tax uh, reform related to CCAV taxation and related to uh, overseas uh, inbound investments. And my question is, uh, corporate tax act article 93-2 is, is in effect, as you said, from January 2020, which is a reform of overseas inbound investment vehicles taxation system on substantive owners of domestic source income. If the Corporate Tax Act Article 93-2 were to apply to the CCAF case, what, sh what would be the result? Uh, that, that's a good point. And uh, there, there was a tax revision, so the law has settled a tax treaty application is for the overseas investment vehicle. So according to the new tax law, tax treaty will be applied at the investor of OIV, so not the OIV's level. But, but the special regulation have also been prepared based on the view that the OIV itself can be a substantive, substantive owner under the certain condition. And looking at the condition, if, if OIV is liable to pay tax at the country of residence, and OIV is not established for the tax avoiding purpose, then, then OIV can be at the substantive owner. So considering the, this new regulation, I, the, this new regulations, these new regulations are in line with the court's decision because CCOPS is liable to pay tax at the Luxembourg and CCAB is not established for tax avoidance purpose. So I think, I think if, if the new regulation were to apply to the CCAB's case, the result would be the same. The CCAB, CCAB will, be the, will be regarded as the substantive owners to be eligible for tax treaty. Thank you. Uh, do we have we, we don't have the screen in front of us, but do we have any message from the audience, international audience, question or you know, comment? No? Okay. Okay, then uh, with this, I hope this session was useful and informative for the audience, especially including foreign investors and international tax practitioners. I'm really grateful to all the panelists for their great contribution. This session is adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>